Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, it's the first time I, I visit this department, so uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, so as Jano was, uh, was mentioning, today I'm going to talk about uh, Higgs physics and, uh, and the physics of, uh, of dark matter. Um, so this, uh, since this colloquium is uh, going to be uh, about uh, Higgs physics, let me start with uh, the status of, uh, of particle physics uh, before of the Higgs discovery. Uh, so we go a little bit back in time, so uh, before uh, 2012. So what did we know about particle physics uh, uh, before 2012? So we knew the existence of uh, many particles. Um, um, many of those uh, were quite massive, as we knew experimentally. But we didn't know uh, for sure what was the uh, uh, theoretical uh, uh, reason for these particles to have a mass. Uh, so we're wondering uh, why we had all these massive particles and we had uh, uh, this uh, beautiful idea of the Higgs mechanism that was uh, uh, already proposed uh, in the 60s. Um, this was a, a theory idea, if you want, then experimental uh, searches started uh, uh, quite a bit later uh, in the 90s and then uh, finally in uh, 2012 we had uh, uh, this uh, big discovery of uh, this new particle. And uh, so the 4th of July of uh, 2012 was uh, a super important date for particle physics. Um, uh, uh, in the morning, uh, certain time, uh, there was this announcement of, uh, of this uh, new particle discovery. Uh, so a lot of celebrations worldwide. Uh, actually, this was not really the best time for uh, US people. So this was in the middle of the night. Uh, so back then, I was at Chicago. Still, we're less celebrating in the middle of the night, obviously. And then, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of follow-up also everywhere in the world. So here there is a picture of uh, the ICEP conference in uh, 2012 that was uh, uh, in, uh, in Melbourne, uh, Australia. Um, um, now, not only this, this discovery was, uh, was followed by, by physicists, but there was a lot of uh, uh, follow-up of uh, of media and, uh, and of the public. So I was asked a lot by my friends and family, what about the Hick this new Higgs boson? And actually, it's, it's, it's kind of funny to see in, uh, in Google Trends. So if you put in Google Trends this, uh, this word, particle physics, uh, and then you see, so Google Trends tells you how many times people looked for this uh, word uh, in Google. And then you can see this nice bump uh, at around July 2012. That is actually probably more evident, I would say, being a theorist than the bump that we see at, uh, at the LHC for the Higgs discovery. Um, so very good. Um, now we have the Higgs. And uh, so as it is shown in this cartoon taken by, from The Economist, we can uh, now have this extended list of particles uh, that we know of. So the particles of the standard model. Uh, so in this cartoon, uh, what we can see is uh, uh, when these particles were first theoretized, uh, this is the first uh, uh, dot here that you see corresponding to each particle, and when these particles were discovered experimentally. Now, what I want to point out uh, in, this, uh, in this cartoon is that uh, actually, right, it can, both, can go both ways. So there are those particles that are actually uh, um, discovered uh, experimentally by accident, if you want, in the sense that we don't expect, uh, the, we didn't expect these particles theoretically. Uh, so this is the case of, of the muon. So we didn't theoretize the, the muon before of the experimental discovery. That's why there is this famous sentence by Rabi who ordered that. Uh, and then there are those particles where, uh, for which it takes, uh, yeah, it took us uh, quite a bit of time between the theory idea and the, and the experimental discovery. Um, so having said that, so what is this colloquium about? Um, so as we'll see, this colloquium is divided in three chapters. Uh, so in the first chapter, I will argue what we, are, uh, um, what we think we'll be able to learn more about uh, particle physics uh, using uh, uh, the Higgs boson. Uh, so using this new tool for uh, searching for more uh, particle physics. This is chapter one. Um, chapter two will uh, uh, be about a different topic, namely uh, dark matter physics. Because in my opinion, dark matter is one of the uh, main open questions for particle physics. Um, and uh, we want to learn more about uh, what is uh, the possible nature of dark matter. 
And what I'm going to ask is, uh, uh, what do we know about uh, light dark matter? So dark matter with a mass that is below the Higgs boson mass, and what, we are, uh, what we'll be able to know more in the coming few years. And then chapter three will be the, our final chapter, and we'll try to connect the two worlds, so the, the world of uh, Higgs physics and the, and the world of dark matter. So we'll use the Higgs boson that we have discovered to learn more about the dark matter. So we'll connect the two. Um, so the discussion will be a uh, little bit theoretical, if you want. So I'm a theoretical particle physicist. Uh, but since I do, I study phenomenology, um, I will connect to two experiments. In particular, I will show you how, uh, what we will be learning in the future from the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, and also by uh, other type of experiments that are uh, stick collider experiments, but are running at lower energy, but uh, uh, higher intensities. Okay. So let's start with the, um, with the first, uh, first chapter. Um, so what do we learn about uh, 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 the Higgs boson? So um, we take back the standard model of particle physics uh, that involves all these particles. We write down the theory for all these particles, uh, the standard model theory. Uh, actually, you can uh, uh, write down in a sort of a illustrative way in just uh, in a cup of coffee. And then we can uh, break uh, in uh, this, uh, this, uh, this cup in several pieces. So you will have a piece, uh, uh, this piece here, that describes the interactions of uh, uh, the several quarks and leptons. Uh, now, if you look at, uh, at this part of the theory, this is uh, fully described uh, if we specify uh, the three free parameters that are the strength of the interaction of the quarks and leptons with uh, the several forces that we know of. So these are free parameters in the sense that the standard model is not telling us what they are, so we need to measure them. Um, then we have the second piece, that is the piece that is, uh, 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 that is leading to the masses and mixing of the several quarks and leptons, so the standard model. Actually, here there are many, many more free parameters, uh, 10 plus 10 or 10 plus 12 if you put uh, uh, Majorana masses for neutrinos. Uh, so we need many more measurements in such a way to fix this part of the, of the theory. But these are all measurements that, um, you know, okay, in neutrino physics, we, we know much less, but, the, you know, we start to have quite a good idea of, of what these uh, parameters are. And then finally, we have this last piece of the theory of the standard model. What does it describe? So this piece uh, um, gives mass to the W and the Z boson of the standard model through uh, uh, the, the Higgs mechanism. It is fully described only by two free parameters. One is what we call the Higgs vacuum expectation value that is directly connected to the uh, W and the Z mass. And then one is the Higgs mass itself. Now you see that here I'm putting the Higgs mass as a free parameter because the standard model is not telling what value, uh, 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 what value this Higgs boson mass has. So we need it to measure. And actually this was uh, the uh, last uh, free parameter of the standard model that we needed to measure uh, in such a way to uh, fully fix uh, the uh, standard model Lagrangian. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see, to read uh, um, um, Pioneer's papers on, uh, on Higgs physics. So I'm here I'm reporting uh, um, part of the conclusions of this paper that was written in 1976 by Ellis, Gallard, and Nanopoulos. Uh, so back then, actually, we have really no idea uh, of, of what value was the Higgs mass. Could have been, you know, pretty light, uh, something like the, the mass of the proton, or it could have been much heavier, 1,000 times the mass of the proton. And uh, it's interesting to see that, uh, you know, there was a little bit of skepticism, and there was not really a big push for uh, experimental searches for the Higgs. So this tells us that uh, maybe no, we should not take uh, theories too seriously always. Um, um, but then, uh, you know, as we know, there was a big experimental effort in uh, trying to find this uh, new particle, the Higgs particle. And then finally, this uh, free parameter of the standard model, the mass of the Higgs boson was measured, 125 GV, so 125 uh, times uh, the mass of the proton. So now, basically, we know all the free parameters of the standard model. What, uh, what can we do with that? We can... Uh, 
uh, do uh, accurate predictions for the several phenomena uh, that are coming from the standard model, and in particular the phenomena associated to this uh, uh, new particle, the Higgs particle. Um, so what we can compute uh, is, for example, the number of Higgs bosons that we expect to be able to produce, to, to produce at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so, as we know, the, the main production uh, uh, mechanism of the Higgs at, at the DLHC is what we call gl through gluon-gluon fusion. Namely, you take uh, two gluons from, uh, from the proton that we are colliding in the LHC. And since the Higgs is coupled uh, to gluons, uh, then we expect to, produ to be producing Higgs through these interactions. But then you, if you look at the numbers, uh, so here what I'm plotting is uh, the number of Higgs bosons that we expect to be uh, producing at LHC per proton-proton collisions. And we see that we, are able, uh, we can only produce a few Higgs bosons uh, per 10 to the 10 proton-proton collisions. So this tells us that the Higgs event is super rare at LHC, and that's why you, really we need a big machine and many, many proton-proton mm, collisions in such a way to have uh, a, a good statistics of Higgs bosons produced. And then here for completeness, I also put the other production modes of the, of the Higgs boson. So this is something that we can theoretically uh, compute very, very precisely. Now that we know the three parameters of the standard model, what else? What we can do is also to predict uh, the way in which the Higgs boson decays very accurately. Um, so we know that once that we produce a Higgs at the LHC, the Higgs will decay super quickly. It is not a stable particle. And we know what are the probabilities for the Higgs to decay to the several uh, other standard model particles. For example, the, uh, the biggest probabilities for the Higgs to decay to a, a bottom and an antibottom. Then we have the decay to taus, uh, to photons, and so on and so forth. So again, also, this uh, is uh, very much under theory control in the sense that the theory errors are very, very small. Okay? So we take all our theory predictions in the framework of the standard model, and uh, we compare to our measurements, the measurements that we can do at the Large Hadron Collider. So um, as, uh, as, we, as we all know, the LHC is uh, colliding many, many protons uh, at, uh, at the super high energy. Um, so the protons are, um, are uh, going around this, uh, uh, this circle with a speed that is very close to the speed of light. Uh, so this machine is a super, uh, if you want, a super fancy and technology advanced uh, uh, machine um, that is uh, colliding uh, protons uh, exactly in four points of this uh, big uh, uh, circumference here. And this could respond to the uh, main uh, detectors of the LHC. Uh, so this is the CMS detector, the Atlas detector, LHCB, and ALICE. Um, so once that we have this comparison between what we measure and uh, the standard model predictions, we can see what we can learn. So now what I want to show you is uh, what we have uh, learned so far um, after the Higgs boson discovery, so in this, uh, say, almost seven years after the Higgs boson discovery. So let's compare before the Higgs discovery and now, okay? So before the, Hig the Higgs discovery, first of all, we didn't know, uh, I would say, if uh, the uh, electroweak interactions, so the interactions that are mediated by the W, the Z bosons of the standard model, as well as the, uh, the photons, were self-consistent if they were self-consistently described by the standard model, and if uh, they fit data. So we had a lot of data, for example, from previous colliders, the large uh, uh, electron-positron collider, and uh, we really needed to discover the Higgs boson uh, to know if this electroweak theory was self-consistent. Now that we have the Higgs boson, we know the Higgs boson mass, we can do global fits of all this data coming also from previous experiments, <laughs> And what we can see is that we obtain a p-value that is pretty high. That means that indeed this theory of electric interactions is self-consistent with data. And this was not something that we would have, uh, no, we could have known before of the Higgs discovery, because suppose that we discovered the Higgs, say, at 500 GeV, 
this p-value would have been super, super small. And this would have told us that electric interactions of the standard model were not self consistent and we needed something extra. So this is the first thing that we, uh, uh, we learned with this uh, discovery. What else? Um, we started to learn about the origin of mass of the several massive particles um, of the standard model. So before we didn't know any mass, where, where, what was the origin? Uh, now we know at least uh, what is the origin of the W and the Z boson mass, as well as uh, uh, the most massive quarks and leptons, uh, uh, so the top, the bottom, and the tau. Um, as I will mention, we still don't know what is the origin, for sure, experimentally, we don't know what is the origin of the light generations of quarks and leptons. Um, and then also, before the Higgs discovery, we didn't know if indeed na in nature we had uh, uh, fundamental scalars, uh, so scalar particles, because all the other particles are not, um, fundamental particles are not scalars. So we didn't know if this brand new particle, scalar particles existed at all. Okay. So now we know that it exists, and we started measuring uh, uh, its properties. And we know its properties with a precision, say, at a level of 10, 20%, something like this. So what are the future goals? Uh, in this, uh, uh, in this effort. So we are going towards a precision program for uh, Higgs physics. So the reason that so far we didn't have much of a precision program is that we have not produced so too many Higgs bosons at LHC. So, so far we have produced something like five millions of Higgses. Um, by the end of the LHC, we expect to be producing uh, something like 30 times more statistics, so something like 160 millions. Uh, by the end of the LHC, so we'll have a much, much larger statistics to play with. And then the goal uh, will be to reduce this uh, uncertainty in the, in the measurements uh, from something like 10, 20% to something at the level of few percent. So in this plot that I'm taking from, I have taken from this uh, CERN yellow report that we recently sent to the archive, uh, this is an effort that was uh, ongoing in the last uh, one and a half years or so in the context of the European physics strategy. So these are the prospects for testing uh, Higgs properties at the high luminosity LHC, so by the end of the LHC. And what we see is that so this, this, uh, these entries here are telling us uh, how well we'll know the Higgs uh, couplings to any other particles of the standard model in the future. And we see that, uh, you know, typically we can get uh, most of these properties with an uncertainty at the level of 2% uh, instead of this uh, 10, 20% that we have now. Um, so this is a future goal, uh, but um, we don't have only precision as a future goal. We have also as a goal um, uh, prospects for discoveries of uh, new uh, processes associated to the Higgs boson. Because there are some processes already that are predicted in the standard model uh, that we have not observed yet. So an example is, uh, so there are several decay modes of the Higgs boson that the standard model is telling us that uh, are there, but they are very rare, that we uh, expect to be able to discover in the future. Um, here I'm putting some example. Higgs decaying to muons uh, is a, an interesting example. We would like to be able to see other processes that are super rare, like uh, we would like to produce in one event at LHC not only one Higgs boson, but two Higgs bosons simultaneously. Um, and this is, again, uh, something that is super rare that we have not yet observed. So this is another goal that we have, so discovering uh, rare processes associated to the Higgs boson. And uh, you might ask, OK, uh, you know, obviously we have a new particle, we want to study it as well as we can, but what do we learn more uh, about uh, additional physics uh, doing this, uh, these measurements? So why um, is that crucial to do this type of measurements? As I already mentioned, exploration of a brand new particle, so this is the first uh, uh, fundamental scalar that we have discovered. But then also, um, doing these measurements, uh, um, uh, we learn about new physics, so we learn about the presence of additional uh, particles beyond the standard model particles. The reason being that if you take a, generically a new physics, a new physics theory um, beyond the standard model, and you look at the Higgs, 
What we expect is that there will be um, quantum uh, corrections to the Higgs, so there will be some new physics deformations to our Higgs boson. So the Higgs uh, uh, properties that we measure at the LHC will deviate if compared to uh, what the standard model is predicting. Okay. So of course it can go in, uh, in two ways. Um, either in the future we'll discover a mismatch between uh, the standard model prediction and experimental measurements, and this tell us that we'll uh, indirectly discover a new physics particle that is uh, responsible of these uh, deformations. It can go in the opposite way, in the sense that we'll keep uh, uh, seeing uh, and measuring something that is consistent with the standard model predictions. Um, and this will imply that we'll have more and more bounds on new physics that is telling us that maybe if new physics is there, has to be more decoupled or uh, from the Higgs boson or in general heavier and more hidden uh, to the physics that we are testing nowadays. Okay. So in both directions, I would say that we learn uh, quite a lot, uh, pushing our uh, frontier of uh, knowledge for Higgs physics. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention this, uh, in this context of Higgs physics is that there are additional open questions uh, connected to the Higgs boson. Um, so many of these particles that we see here in the framework of the standard model do have a mass, but we don't know if their mass is connected to the Higgs mechanism. So we don't know experimentally if, for example, the, the mass of the electron or the mass of the muon is really coming from the Higgs mechanism or something else. So this is something that we have not yet measured and uh, we would like really to know because the standard model is telling us that all these particles, the mass is coming from the Higgs mechanism. We would like to test that. Um, also, we would like to understand if the Higgs is the only fundamental scalar that we have in nature, or maybe we have additional Higgs bosons. We want to know if the Higgs violate some of the symmetries or approximate symmetries on nature, as for example, the CP uh, symmetry, and so on and so forth. So there are many questions that uh, we expect to uh, uh, know, you know, know better answers in the coming years at the LHC. So this is my uh, Higgs chapter. Now I would like that you uh, remember a little bit of this information. We'll pass to a new chapter, uh, the chapter of, uh, of dark matter, and then we'll connect the two, okay? So as I mentioned at the beginning of this colloquium, I, 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 I truly believe that dark matter is one of the uh, main questions for uh, uh, particle physics and uh, astrophysics nowadays. Um, we know that uh, we need to have something no, that is affecting, for example, gravitational curves uh, of, uh, of galaxies or cluster of galaxies. Uh, beyond the, the gravitational information, we don't know much about this uh, uh, new form of matter. Uh, we know that it's dark, as the name, name says, namely that it doesn't interact with, uh, with photons. It has to be sort of stable. In, uh, on cosmological scales, because otherwise we would not see dark matter now. And then also we know that is, uh, is a lot. Um, so here is, uh, usually you see a chart for dark matter. I put the glass of beer, dark matter. And here, uh, um, if you read the numbers, uh, we know that we have something like four or five times more dark matter than the, the usual matter uh, in the energy budget of the universe. So this is, um, you know, broadly speaking, the, the most of the things that we know about the, this new form of matter. Actually, here there is a fun fact that even if we say that we have a lot of dark matter, uh, you know, concretely speaking, we don't have so much dark matter. So on Earth, if you take a cup of, uh, of coffee, you expect to have maybe a couple of dark matter particles uh, if they are as heavy as the Higgs. So not incredibly much, but anyway. Um, so. What's, uh, what's the status of, uh, of dark matter uh, searches and uh, theory understanding? So for, for the last three decades or so, um, one of the, probably the dominant um, uh, um, uh, scenario for dark matter was this uh, scenario for uh, weakly interacting uh, massive particles or WIMPs. Um, so the idea, is relatively simple, namely that in the early universe we had uh, a, this uh, new type of matter, a WIMP, um, that was in thermal equilibrium with, uh, with the standard model matter. And um, um, if we take this, uh, this WIMP dark matter, 
We will interact with uh, the weak interactions uh, of the standard model. So we'll have a coupling of dark matter, say, with the Z boson of the standard model. Because of these interactions, uh, uh, it can uh, annihilate to standard model particles. And if you put numbers, you see that you get uh, uh, the right, uh, the, the measure of the relic abundance for this type of dark matter if its mass is uh, not too far away from uh, 100 GeV. Okay? So this is pretty much a good coincidence, right? Because in principle, you can do this exercise of computing this uh, annihilation cross-section. Uh, you compare with the relic abundance that we observe, and the mass that you extract could have been anything. Could have been you know, a thousand times uh, heavier or lighter than this. So it's a sort of a nice coincidence to see that we end up having something uh, with a mass close to the mass of the Higgs boson. Um, now, this has motivated a lot of searches. Um, Actually, in this context of WIMP, uh, the LHC, uh, you know, I would say that the LHC is a, a WIMP factory because uh, if WIMPs are there, we expect to produce many, many at LHC through proton-proton collisions, through di diagrams like this. Uh, and then once that we produce, we have, you know, uh, good chances for detecting them. Uh, another major uh, 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 type of experiments that we have been doing in such a way to discover this type of, uh, of dark matter are direct detection experiments, where broadly the idea is to look for the scattering of dark matter with, uh, uh, with our own detectors, so with the usual matter, with the nuclei of uh, the detectors. And um, um, so far, we had no conclusive uh, evidence for the existence of this uh, uh, form of dark matter. Um, so typically, what you see are bounds on the existence of this, uh, of this uh, dark matter of this type. Um, so in this plot here, what I'm showing is uh, a, a cartoon for the bounds as a function of the dark matter mass that is unknown, even though you know, the WIMP miracle or coincidence is telling us that we expect something uh, not too far away from this 100 GV mass scale. And then here on the y-axis, this is the cross-section for uh, uh, the scattering of dark matter with uh, nucleons. In general, you can think about uh, having here on the y-axis, if you go um, um, uh, here, uh, um, in this direction, you have larger and larger couplings of dark matter with, uh, with standard model matter. And everything that is here in gray has been already probed by combination of LHC measurements here and direct detection experiments. Um, on this plane, you can also put a sort of a vanilla WIMP model, uh, the simplest model that you can think of, where you have indeed uh, just the interactions through the Z boson. And you see that indeed the WIMP, uh, the vanilla WIMP would be already quite uh, probed. So this tells us that uh, even though, in my opinion, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's hard to say that a complete model is fully, fully excluded, we can say that the vanilla WIMP are already pretty much probed by, uh, by these experiments. So uh, this has motivated uh, uh, theorists and experimentalists to, um, you know, broaden this, uh, uh, this uh, program for dark matter searches and uh, dark matter theories. So what I want to ask in this colloquium is indeed what happens if we are uh, at lower masses? Because you see that if you go, say, below 10 GV or so, in general, uh, this, um, uh, the constraints are uh, weaker. Okay? And as I will show you, actually, at lower masses, also models are kind of uh, different than uh, WIMP models that we have discussed so far. And um, I think that this is a good question because, in general, uh, I mean, the WIMP idea is a, is a great and uh, cute idea. But we have to know that, uh, you know, contrary to the, to the physics uh, uh, associated to the electroweak interactions, uh, Higgs physics, uh, we don't know where dark matter resides in terms of mass scale. Um, so here I'm putting uh, the, um, the, um, the scale for dark matter. So, so far we have discussed WIMPs that, uh, as I argued, uh, should have a mass that is not too far away from the Higgs boson mass, call it uh, 100 GV, so you are here. Um, but then you can have uh, completely uh, different candidates for dark matter. You can have axion uh, dark matter, you can have uh, sterile neutrinos, you can have uh, uh, maybe uh, black holes. There are a lot of uh, possibilities for, uh, for dark matter. 
And then, of course, depending on the mass scale where you are, we need uh, completely different search strategies, experimental search strategies uh, to discover this type of dark matter. So what I want to ask uh, um, is what happens uh, if we are here? So if we are below uh, 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 the, the scale for WIMPs, so below 100 GV, but if you are not too light. So if you are here, um, um, the question, first of all, is what type of models you can write down? And then how to test them. Um, what is interesting about this uh, region here is that if you still want to have a thermal uh, dark matter, so a dark matter that uh, in the early universe had a, the same temperature as the uh, standard model matter, you need additional particles associated to dark matter. So you need, for example, an additional force or uh, a, an additional uh, uh, scalar and so on and so forth. So basically, if you want to have a thermal scenario, you learn that you need not only a new dark matter particle to add to the standard model, but also additional dark, matter, uh, additional dark particles. And this is what we call a dark sector, namely you know, a sector that includes uh, not only one particle, but more than one. Um, um, so it is drawn in this way because uh, you could think about uh, you know, the standard model that has so many particles. And in principle, also the dark sector could have uh, you know, quite a few particles uh, that we need uh, in such a way to have a thermal scenario. Um, so you might wonder, OK, I'm going to talk about uh, light particles. Um, we have a very powerful machine that is the LHC. Maybe we are already probing these regions here. Is that true? Um, so we go to take summary plots uh, from the LHC. Um, so the LHC is probing, uh, is searching for a lot of new, phys new, new physics particles. And um, you can uh, go in the website of the Atlas Collaboration, for example, or CMS. And then you will see plots like these uh, for a lot, a lot of searches. So these are uh, Exotica searches of Atlas. And what you see, so these bands are telling us uh, how heavy these particles should be uh, such that uh, uh, we are not running into uh, constraints from, uh, from present searches. So in general, if we are not able to discover a particle, that means that we are excluding high, higher and higher masses, because if a particle is too heavy, then we are not producing that uh, enough at the LHC. And if you look at the numbers, uh, generically, we are probing already quite well uh, the TV scale, 1,000 GV. Um, of course, there are caveats, but we see that our uh, reach on uh, heavy new physics is uh, quite broad at the LHC. Now I'm talking about something that is much, much lighter. So we are not even included in this plot. And the reason that we are not included is that uh, uh, from the LHC perspective, uh, um, in general, it can be uh, even more challenging to look for light particles than heavier particles. Um, so heavier particles can lead to more spectacular uh, signatures at the LHC than light particles, say, of a few GV. So in general, it might be uh, more challenging for the LHC uh, collaborations to look for uh, uh, light uh, GV scale particles than heavier particles of a few hundred GV. So th there is really the need of having a targeted uh, LHC program to test uh, these uh, elusive uh, hidden uh, light particles, because otherwise, in general, it's, uh, it's challenging to probe uh, if you are here below. Okay. So having said that, so this is a slide to tell you that uh, even though you know, there are a lot of uh, LHC searches for new physics, uh, it's not really straightforward to uh, discover light new physics below, say, 10 GeV or so. And um, 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 in the last uh, uh, few years or so, there have been a larger and larger community effort for the search for, uh, um, uh, for light uh, dark sectors. Uh, this has put together uh, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of theories uh, together with experimentalists coming from uh, uh, completely different uh, type of experiments. Uh, so here I'm uh, showing some pictures taken from uh, uh, some of the workshops that we have run in the last uh, few years. Uh, the last one was probably this, uh, this in December in, uh, in Korea. And um, 
um, of course, I mean, if the, the goal here is not only to write down theories for dark sector, but also, of course, to discover them, then the question is uh, how are we able to do experiments to test uh, a sector that is uh, separated from the standard model, a dark sector? Um, so since, uh, as of right here, we live in the standard model sector, how can we have access to the dark sector? What are the probes that we can design such to discover uh, a dark sector? Now, theoretically, what is nice is that uh, uh, there are only a few opportunities to connect the two sectors, the standard model on one side and the dark sector on the other side. And um, so this is uh, uh, what we call a, a portal. So what is a portal? Um, so a portal, um, uh, portal interactions are those interactions that allow us, theoretically, to write down um, a coupling between uh, a, a particle in the dark sector, for example, a dark photon, like the photon of the standard model, and the particle of the standard model sector. And what is interesting is that there is a really a, a small set of uh, possibilities uh, that we have theoretically to connect the two sectors, and this is all that we have. So four portals. Dark photon portal, we see, so we are uh, putting in, uh, in touch uh, a dark photon with a photon of the standard model. The Higgs portal, so we are putting in touch a new Higgs boson with the Higgs that we have discovered, the neutrino portal and the axion portal. Now, the question is, uh, since we have only these possibilities, uh, how can we exploit as much as we can our experiments that are running now in such a way to discover these connections? And as I want to argue uh, for the rest of this colloquium is that there are many opportunities using uh, either the LHC, so high energy, or using uh, um, uh, experiments that are running now with high intensity, such to discover these portals. And the goal would be to uh, definitely uh, test uh, this, uh, this scenario after demanding that the dark matter is thermal because we know that we need some, uh, some coupling between dark matter and us, okay? So what I want to show you is that uh, for, from, uh, so let's start from here, so high intensity. Um, so what, uh, what are the collider experiments that you can use uh, to such to test these portals? So we can divide the collider experiments in two categories. Um, so there is the first category that is colliding beams. Uh, of course, here I could put the, the, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, but uh, since I am now focused to uh, high-intensity experiments, let me mention uh, uh, B factories, so E plus, E minus colliders. So here, instead of colliding protons, we collide uh, electron and, uh, electrons and positrons. On the other side, uh, we have what we call uh, fixed target experiments that uh, uh, collide uh, one beam against, indeed, some fixed target, so some fixed matter and then we see what comes out of that. And there are many of these uh, fixed target experiments that are running now with uh, completely different uh, physics goals. There are some uh, you know, experiments that are running to test the physics associated to kaons. Uh, uh, so these are uh, 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 mesons, uh, so quark bound states. There are proton beam dump experiments, electron beam dump experiments. Even neutrino experiments can be thought in these terms because you have a neutrino beam colliding uh, against some detector. And um, so using these collider experiments, uh, um, we can produce actually a dark particle. So we take back our portals uh, that we saw before. For example, the Higgs portal, this is one example. And then if we collide two particles of the standard model, like E plus, E minus, as we see here, since we can produce a Higgs, uh, automatically we can also produce uh, one of these scalars, uh, dark scalars. So using this idea, uh, we would like to have a program that is existing all these uh, uh, existing facilities, uh, that is using these existing facilities to test uh, as much as we can uh, this uh, uh, um, dark sector idea. So what I want to do next is to show you a couple of examples, okay? So I will pick uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, experiment, uh, uh, B factories or proton beam dumps to show you what are the opportunities for the coming years, okay? Um, um, so let's start with, uh, with B factories. 
So why am I excited about B-Factories? Um, so in addition to being this advisor committee for Bell 2, uh, I think that this is uh, you know, really a great experiment. Um, so this is an experiment that is running in, uh, in Japan at KK. And um, it's colliding a plus and minus uh, um, uh, with uh, a central mass energy close to 10 GV. So obviously much lower than uh, the LHC energy. Um, uh, in terms of time, uh, so this is a very timely exploration because uh, uh, the second phase of, uh, of the Bell experiment, so Bell 2, is taking place now, right now. So last year we had the first run uh, with part of the detector. So this is uh, the detector of, of Bell, or Bell 2, sorry. And now we have finally the full detector and we started uh, taking this uh, basically 10 days ago. Uh, so we started to have uh, uh, E plus E minus collisions uh, exactly 10 days ago. Um, now the main physics goal for this experiment is not really dark matter, um, but is the study of B mesons. That's why this is a B factory in the sense that we'll be able to produce uh, many, many, many B mesons. So bound state with a, with a B quark. But actually, um, what is exciting is that you can use exactly the same experiment to do different data analysis and to try to uh, explore and eventually discover these physics associated to dark sectors. Uh, so there are many opportunities for dark sectors as well. Um, so you can look for uh, uh, dark particles produced from B meson decays. So a B meson can decay to a dark scalar, for example. Um, you can produce, uh, uh, for example, dark photons directly from E plus E minus collisions, similar to you know, the production of photons. So there are many opportunities for uh, testing the portals, uh, uh, the dark portals that I showed you at uh, a few slides ago. Um, and uh, so to give an example, there, are, there start to be a few studies Actually, this is a pretty much growing field, but there are a few studies to understand the feasibility for searching for these uh, new particles at the Bell 2. Um, um, so in this plot, what I'm doing is to show what are the prospects for discovering dark photons. Um, so uh, you can produce dark photons from E plus E minus collisions. Because of the same uh, portal operator, the dark photon uh, uh, portal that we saw before, the dark photon can decay to uh, leptons of the standard model. And then uh, at, at Bell 2, you can search for these two leptons. So this is uh, what, uh, what we expect to be able to probe. Um, so uh, similar to dark matter, the dark photon mass is unknown. Um, so these dark matter models are giving us a strong motivation for looking for dark photons that are relatively light. That's why this plot uh, you know, ends at uh, 10 GV or so. And uh, here on the y-axis, what we are showing is uh, indeed the, the uh, dark photon portal operator that I, sh that I uh, was writing before. Of course, going to higher and higher values of this, uh, of this coupling means that the dark photon is coupled to the standard model world uh, more and more. And that means that experimentally we are able uh, to, to probe these types of scenarios. And then we see that uh, basically these colored regions here are the regions that have been probed in the past. Um, for example, this uh, green region uh, is the region uh, that uh, has been probed by previous uh, B factories, by Babar, at Slack. And, um, and here, these lines here are the prospects for probing uh, this portal at, uh, at uh, Bell 2 in the coming few years. And we see that we expect to have a jump in, uh, in, the, in the couplings that we are probing by, you know, uh, a, a relatively big factor. Okay. So this is uh, the, the first example I wanted to show you. Um, and the second example is in the context of uh, proton beam dump experiments. Um, so what are the proton beam dump experiments? So these are, again, high-intensity experiments in the sense that we have high-intensity beams of protons here coming from here, that we collide against some uh, target uh, that is followed eventually by this uh, dump, so this is a block of matter, that is shielding from a lot of uh, you know, standard model radiation. It's such a way that the idea is that here, in this decay volume, uh, we have the propagation only of uh, our dark particles. It can be dark matter, it can be a dark photon. 
that then we detect uh, 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 afterwards uh, here in our detectors. Now, um, this is, uh, uh, you know, I, I will show you some prospects for proton beam dumps because this is uh, something that is uh, uh, quite exciting in my opinion, something that I've studied in the last few years. But uh, similarly, we can use, uh, uh, you know, neutrino experiments or we can use electron fixed target experiment uh, such uh, to search for these particles in a pretty similar manner. And this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned here, is a, is a relatively uh, rich experimental landscape in the sense that the, since these experiments are smaller scale, we have a few of them uh, that are online now or online in the, in the next coming years. So the, um, the experiment that I've been most focusing on in the last few years is called the Sequest. And uh, so this is a, a nuclear physics experiment that is running at, uh, at Fermilab National Laboratory uh, close to Chicago. So this is a cartoon for this experiment. Um, you can see that uh, you know, it doesn't look too different from, uh, from this cartoon. But uh, so what we are doing is uh, to take uh, uh, part of the uh, main injector proton beam of Fermilab. So this is a high intensity proton beam with an energy of 120 GV, so relatively high. Colliding it uh, against some dump, so this is a magnetic uh, 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 big piece of iron. Um, and then afterwards we have a detector that, that can uh, um, detect and, uh, and um, uh, pretty well uh, muons uh, that we can produce uh, afterwards here. Okay. As I mentioned, so this, is a um, this, uh, this experiment has been running in the context of nuclear physics uh, to measure parton distribution functions pretty well. Um, um, there have been a program uh, since already several years in the context of nuclear physics. And only more recently, uh, the, we had this idea of using exactly this experiment for testing particle physics. Um, uh, in particular, uh, yeah, only two years ago or so, we, had, uh, we have done uh, a small upgrade of this experiment uh, in such a way to be able to see uh, eventually, you know, particles that are giving us displaced muons, so particles that are produced here, they go, 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 and then uh, they decay just uh, after the dump, and then muons are reconstructed from uh, coming after the dump. But this to say that we have been a bit of an upgrade to this experiment that is still used for nuclear physics, but now we are really fully in shape for looking for uh, uh, these dark sector models. And um, uh, we have been doing uh, an engineering run, um, collecting a little bit of data, 10 to the 16 protons on target. So 10 to the 16 protons were collided against this target. This can seem a large number, but in the context of high intensity, it's not that large, actually. And, um, and now the plan um, is uh, to start running again, in a, hopefully in a few months, and collect a much, much larger uh, uh, statistics of data. So something like two orders of magnitude or so. And then, of course, there are questions for the future. So after this run, um, um, are we going to do some additional upgrades of the experiment? Are we going to collect more data? Uh, so we are building on the uh, physics case for this experiment. And we are trying to understand what, uh, what probes of these portals we can have in the future. And this, again, is the same uh, you know, portal, dark photon portal uh, that I was showing you before with the prospect uh, to probe a parameter space from Sequest. So these are the purple lines. So again, the, the gray regions are regions probed in the past. Uh, previously, I was showing you the same plot, but with a different uh, scale, because you see that the Bell 2 is here. Actually, it's testing uh, larger masses and larger couplings, and Sequest is here. Okay. So from here, we see that uh, there is a lot of complementarity of uh, models that we can probe on one side at uh, uh, B factories, the other side at uh, these proton fixed target experiments. And there is a lot that we can gain uh, in, uh, in the next, next few years. Okay. Now, you might wonder, OK, I did these uh, uh, two good stories, one for the Higgs, one for light dark matter. Um, uh, how can we connect the two? Why the two stories should be connected? And this leads to my last uh, short chapter that is uh, testing light dark matter with Higgs boson. So first of all, the question is, uh, why do we expect uh, that the Higgs might be connected to, to light dark matter? 
So we know that dark matter, if it is there as a particle, it has to have a mass. So the question is, indeed, uh, what is the origin of mass uh, of this particle? Um, is that a Higgs mechanism? So is the Higgs that is giving mass to this particle or not? If, um, um, if yes, uh, that means that the Higgs uh, needs necessarily to interact with dark matter. Otherwise, it cannot give the mass. If not, then maybe we have uh, an additional uh, uh, scalar or Higgs boson that is responsible of giving mass to dark matter. And then typically what we learn in genetically in theories is that the Higgs uh, 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 will interact with, the, with this uh, new dark scalar. And if the dark scalar is light, as required by these models for light dark matter, then the Higgs uh, will decay to dark, uh, dark scalars. So in general, we learn, uh, uh, broadly speaking, that we expect to have uh, Higgs uh, decaying to these dark particles. So what we say, the Higgs decaying invisibly. Invisibly because we don't really see dark matter directly in our LHC detectors, but it will be missed by the detectors. Uh, but then you might wonder, OK, how, how do we discover something like this if it is invisible? And there are uh, very interesting ways. Uh, namely, you can think about uh, uh, producing the Higgs at LHC in association with something, because uh, a lot of events at LHC don't only produce a, one Higgs boson, but they produce maybe a Higgs uh, in association with quarks or jets, as we say. Then you measure the jets. You need always to conserve energy momentum, your events. And then you learn that since you are missing the dark matter or a dark scalar, then uh, there is something missing, because otherwise energy momentum wouldn't, uh, conserve, wouldn't be conserved. So you can, you can uh, conclude that, that indeed you have a Higgs sticking to something that you are missing. Okay. So this is one opportunity to test uh, uh, light dark matter through Higgs invisible decays. But there are many more opportunities. Uh, 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 maybe, I mean, there are many more opportunities because uh, if the Higgs is decaying to this uh, uh, dark sector particles, uh, um, uh, there is the possibility for these dark sector particles to also decay to standard model particles. And then from here, what you get is a, uh, are several uh, new signatures for the LHC. So for example, you can have the Higgs decaying to two new dark Higgs bosons, one of which decaying to two bottom quarks and one of which decaying to two muons. So this is, for example, a sort of a fake event that we draw uh, for uh, advertising this uh, um, uh, review paper on Higgs exotic decays. So an exotic decay is uh, you know, a, a decay of the Higgs boson that is uh, happening uh, in any physics theory, but not in the standard model. And that produces uh, light new particles in the final state. Okay. And uh, there are many, many signatures that the LHC can look for uh, to test these scenarios. As well as also we know that if uh, indeed the dark scalar exists, uh, and, uh, and it communicates with the Higgs that we have discovered, then we expect that the, the Higgs measurements, uh, precision measurements that we are doing at, at the LHC will be affected by the presence of this uh, dark scalar. And therefore, we'll see uh, uh, some, maybe we'll see some deviations that will tell us about the existence of these uh, dark scalars. So this leads to my conclusions. Um, so I hope you're convinced that now that we, after the Higgs discovery, we have not only a new particle, but we have a, a new particle that we can use as a tool to uh, discover or to probe uh, new physics theories. In particular, in this colloquium, I decided to focus on the possibilities for, of uh, learning about light dark matter using the, the Higgs boson. And uh, the Higgs opportunities are very much complementary to the opportunities that we have uh, at uh, other experiments, uh, high intensity experiments, uh, as I showed you. Many of these experiments are already running now for also completely different uh, you know, uh, physics uh, reasons. But we can use these experiments uh, to test uh, dark sector models. So hopefully, uh, yeah, we'll learn uh, a lot more uh, after, uh, you know, with, with these experiments in the next uh, few years, such to understand much better if this uh, light dark matter scenario that is thermal is indeed something that is realized in nature or not. Thanks.
talking about this. <laughs> it's, so you're asking exactly, sorry, I, I, I didn't understand the. Yeah, so, um, so generically, uh, what I was arguing for this slide is that if you have a light dark sector, you expect that the Higgs will decay to this light dark sector. So the Higgs won't decay only to standard model particles as it is predicted by the standard model, but the Higgs will decay to dark, uh, uh, to dark photons, or in this case, to dark uh, scalars. So this is something that we generically expect uh, in theories whenever we have something that is lighter than the Higgs boson. This is pretty much generic. And this uh, gives us uh, a, a, a large set of signatures that we can look for uh, at the LHC. Yeah, so for this specific experiment that I, I show here, no, this is not really much of a problem because uh, um, um, so this experiment is looking for uh, uh, leptons in the final state. Um, um, and then typically having neutrinos coming out from here doesn't really affect much the reach. So I don't know if you are wondering about backgrounds to these uh, signals that... Uh, Right. Oh. oh, very good. So that's right. So if, uh, if, uh, so if you forget about the sequence experiment, but you think about uh, searching for dark matter only using these detectors, then the neutrinos are the main source of background. So you have somehow to disentangle between the neutrinos that you are producing here and that are scattering with your detector with dark matter. Um, um, so Kinematically, there are ways because, you know, typically we are thinking about dark matter particles that are heavier than the neutrinos. Uh, but, but generically, I mean, neutrinos will give you background. Now, for this experiment here, this is a bit different because here we are looking for a dark particle that decays and then, um, then we are good. <laughs> That's right, that's right. Yeah, so that's right. So there are also other ways to disentangle because uh, so this is a, what we call an on-axis detector. You can put a detector, say, here with some angle and then uh, um, um, you can, uh, I mean, your backgrounds will go down. Of course, also signals will go down. But uh, yeah, there are ways to, to suppress background and still having the signal. Um, uh, so you're thinking about the uh, ISC or CLIC and uh, yeah, so um, there are many opportunities in, uh, in the direction of precision uh, Higgs, uh, Higgs measurements. So I think what is uh, super important to highlight for uh, E plus E minus machine versus uh, Hadron machines is that uh, E plus E minus machines uh, like ISC or CLIC are giving us an opportunity to measure the Higgs width in a model independent way. So I was showing uh, uh, constraints on uh, Higgs, uh, um, Higgs coupling at LHC. But uh, a, a, as you know, right, the, 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 these constraints on Higgs couplings are coming uh, with some assumptions on the, on the theory. So the assumption that we are doing here, for example, is that the Higgs width, uh, uh, you don't have indeed the Higgs exotic decays, so the width is like in the standard model. In general, it can be broader. And then these couplings, uh, the fit will be different. Uh, so there are assumptions that you need to do for any Hadron colliders. For E plus E minus colliders, you get uh, extraction of Higgs properties in a model independent way. And this is, a, in my opinion, an enormous value because it doesn't really depend on the, on the model that the theorist writes down. Plus, on top of that, we have also precision and uh, we, we can get Higgs coupling in a, a very high precision. But the model independent part is, uh, I think, super important to to have in mind. Yeah, 
Yes, so they are, uh, um, so yeah, I was not mentioning here, but uh, so if you think about light dark matter, they are sort of, you know, a set of uh, different cosmological uh, constraints that one has to keep into account. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, there are a lot of, of uh, you know, information that we get uh, from cosmology on one side and also from uh, astrophysical probes on the other side that are quite different than uh, what we learned for WIMPs, absolutely, yeah. So there are also, you know, uh, constraints from CMB, for example, or, um, you know, absolutely. So this was a sort of a more particle physics focused talk, but absolutely there is really a lot of interplay between the, the two. Okay, so let's, um, um, yeah, so if we go back here, so as, as, uh, as we were discussing this morning, uh, I think a, really a, a concrete goal that we can have is uh, to probe thermal dark matter in this mass range. You need, uh, as I said, to put the assumption of thermal because if it is not thermal, then uh, the, the coupling between this dark matter and the standard model can be very, very, very fee um, feeble. So, so if you assume that it's thermal, um, then uh, as far as I have seen, uh, there are really good opportunities to test uh, these scenarios uh, using actually, um, what is that? Using this electron, uh, electron fixed target experiments. So there is a proposal uh, for uh, an experiment that is called uh, uh, LDMX, so light dark matter experiment. Um, and the idea is, um, you know, it's pretty simple, namely that you, um, what is that? So you take uh, this, um, an electron beam, and uh, so you take here an electron beam, you put a target, and then you look at, uh, you know, you measure the electron beam afterwards. Now, if you do that and then you produce this dark matter, something is missing, so the electron beam will, uh, will be depleted. And then measuring this electron beam, you can set constraints on the production of dark matter. And then if you take these minimal models for, for these portals that I was showing, uh, um, um, generically you probe the thermal uh, line uh, using this type of experiments uh, as, uh, as it has been shown uh, in the, the proposal for this experiment. Um, so this is pretty generic. If you want really to, to test thermal dark matter, uh, um, yeah. Of course, uh, as I said, I mean, I don't want to, you know, say something that is not completely true in the sense that one can find loopholes to try to hide it more. But uh, as I said, broadly speaking, I think we can achieve this goal. And um, yeah. Um, yeah, so here the assumption is that uh, dark matter becomes thermal because uh, of the interaction with one of these particles. And um, um, so if, for example, you have only one Higgs boson and through it you have a desthermalization, then uh, um, yeah, one can, you know, one can build models that are more complicated than that and to hide it more. But then, uh, as I said, I mean, from my point of view, then uh, you start to be in a sort of a WIMP type of situation because I, I, I don't think one can claim that WIMPs are totally excluded, you know? But then you start to feel like, uh, you know, you have to work a bit harder. And then maybe it's not as appealing as, uh, as it was maybe 10 years ago. So I think that is already a very concrete goal that we can have for this light dark matter as we had for WIMPs and uh, WIMPs here we are. And I think that we learn a lot about WIMPs. Uh, and, and this would be, in my opinion, the target for the, for the coming years for light dark matter. <laughs> 